talk of uh, this Saturday morning in stage A. And we've got uh, Ed Lockhart talking about don't feed them after midnight, reverse engineering the Furby Connect. Over Thank to you. you. Cheers. Morning, folks. Um, thanks for bearing with us for all these like, technical glitches. I know it's not ideal, um, but the team over there have been fantastic, so thank you very much, guys. Um, quick bit of housekeeping. I know some of you might have brought Furbies along to the talk, it sounds like. If you have, um, please turn them off and take the batteries out and leave them out until the end of the talk. Uh, if you don't, they might end up uh, doing some strange things when I do the demo a little bit later. So you have been warned, okay? Um, Second thing is, uh, I am only one half of a two-man team. Um, Paul Stone is the other person who did this work, uh, who is amazingly talented and just a very, very nice guy in general. So um, yeah, he couldn't be here this, this weekend, um, but I know he would have loved to have met all of you. So uh, one other thing uh, is that although we are talking about essentially sort of breaking the Furby Connect today. Um, I don't want to in any way rubbish on the toy. It's actually quite a good bit of kit. Uh, and if you take it apart, you'll see it's actually quite well put together. There's some really interesting hardware um, to play with there. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to show that although that is the case, with a few sort of minor security additions, it'd just be that much better. That being said, um, as this article will, will agree with me, if you do invite one into your home, you are probably a little bit mentally deranged. So why were we actually looking at these Furbies in the first place? Um, I work for a, uh, an information security company called Context. Uh, I'm on their research team. And we were hired by uh, Witch Magazine to have a look at IoT toys uh, in general. Uh, specifically, we were looking at this Furby Connect. Um, the original Furby came out in 1998 and looked a little bit like this guy. Um, they very quickly became quite popular. Um, and originally, they were sold for $35. That soon jumped up to $100, $300 if you were buying it from a reseller. Um, the most expensive Furby was this one, which went for $100 thousand dollars apparently um, absolutely crazy but you can possibly see why um, oh there we go that much money um, they were also famously banned from this place that's Fort Meade in Maryland um, because the Americans were worried that their supposed language learning ability would somehow leak all their code names obviously it didn't but um, that's just them being paranoid um, the current generation of the Furby is this guy that's the Furby connect this is the one we're looking at uh, and when that came out or when we when we started our research that was being sold for uh, 32 pounds that value has since changed significantly uh, since we've done the work but uh, when we did the, the first bit of study that's how much they're being sold for uh, and this will come with an accompanying app, as many bits of IoT rubbish uh, generally do these days. Um, this is the Furby Connect World app uh, in the Android store. You can also get this for iOS, um, and that helps you kind of play with the toy. So what does that look like? Here is a little uh, clip. Hopefully that's displaying. OK, we haven't got sound for this, but that's fine. Um, you can see what's happening here is the Furby Connect toy. Is <laughs> Furby loves to share kid-friendly videos. And you can see that the Furby um, kind of downloads uh, a video of some description to your device and it will watch it with you. So you have a sort of YouTube video watching friend. Um, that's, yeah, I know, that's, that's kind of the gimmick. It's a little bit sad, but that's, that's what's going on. Um, so how does that work? Um, your Furby Connect World app uh, will connect over to the internet by your Wi-Fi connection or maybe uh, 3G connection. Um, and it'll talk to the Hasbro servers, which are all hosted on Amazon Web Services. Um, at the local end, it'll connect to your Furby uh, with Bluetooth Low Energy, so BLE. Um, now, some work has been done looking at that Wi-Fi connection already. Two very talented Australians uh, called Mike Loss and Swales Barkley uh, did some work man the middling that Wi-Fi connection, uh, and they were able to inject their own uh, video. You can see here, this is a Furby playing The Exorcist, which is great. Um, I don't think we've got sound here as well, but if it was talking, you'd hear it like doing all the, the kind of the, the demon lines. It's really quite good. Um, this video is up on their GitHub, so please check it out in your own time. OK, so we were kind of less interested in that because it kind of meant that um, if we were, if we were att attacking the Wi-Fi side of things, it's a little bit sort of circumstance dependent. It kind of depends what the, um, the target's Wi-Fi setup actually is. So instead, we looked at this, um, this Bluetooth connection instead. That was very much between the app and the toy. And we kind of be the same in every, every setup. Um, now, a very quick uh, preview, or a quick uh, overview of how Bluetooth works, if you haven't encountered it before. Um, when your device uh, turns on its Bluetooth radio, what it does is it advertises uh, a number of uh, services. Uh, and these are kind of logical uh, groupings of these things called characteristics. Uh, now, you as a, as a person talking to this device will, will read and write data to those characteristics. And the services are kind of logical ways of putting them together. So if you had, say, like a Bluetooth speaker, you might have one service that you would write to to send audio to it, and another service you might interact with to kind of control volumes and, and that kind of thing. This all together we refer to as the gap profile. And that's kind of your, your device's Bluetooth uh, footprint. 
And if you'd like to go out and have a look at some GAP profiles, you can do that really, really easily. Um, this is the NRF Connect app, which is available for iOS and Android. Um, it's published by Nordic Semiconductor, who make a lot of uh, Bluetooth radio devices. Uh, and you can download this to your smartphone or, or tablet and just start scanning stuff and see what GAP profiles look like. So here is the GAP profile for the Furby Connect. It's quite complicated. Um, don't worry too much about all of the, the words there. We're just going to look at the services, which are these guys. Um, it's a good kind of place to, place to kind of focus your attention. Now, what's really great about looking at services is every service has a unique identifying string, a UID. And you can actually look these up to try and find out what services your device uh, is offering, if you ha even if you haven't seen it before. Now, these first three are all kind of quite generic. Most devices will have these. They kind of tell you a little bit of information about what the device is, roughly what firmware it's running, its serial number, things that we're not super interested in as an attacker. Um, well, you know, possibly might be, but you know, generally, it's not super helpful. This next service uh, has a UID which identifies it as the Nordic NRF 51 DFU, that's Direct Firmware Update, over the air OTA firmware update service. Great. Um, now, there's two versions of this service. The first one supports um, signed firmware updates, which means that you as a, as a developer can sign your firmware updates, um, push it to the device of Bluetooth. If your signature is verified as correct, it'll, it'll flash it. If not, it'll throw it away. And there's an, there's an older version which doesn't do that signature checking. This is the older version. Um, <laughs> So we actually didn't end up looking at this, this uh, particular service uh, for a number of reasons. I won't get into that now because I think we are quite short on time. Um, but if you'd like me to talk about that later, you can ask me after the talk or ask a question. That's also fine. The one we looked at instead was this service over here, this, this fluff service. That sounds interesting. You can see there's loads of characteristics on there to play with too. So what's going on there? Thankfully, a very nice uh, German uh, computer science student by the name of Florian Juchner had already done quite a lot of work looking at this. Um, and this is Florian playing with the NRF Connect um, app uh, and actually yeah, yeah, getting the Furby to do some quite interesting stuff. You can see here he sends the byte DB to the Furby over, over its Bluetooth connection, and that causes it to display those, those, uh, that, that debug menu in its eyes, which is really, really helpful for us trying to figure out what's actually going on under there. So we'll just show him doing that, sending the byte, and we should see debug menu. Great. So nicely, nice work, Florian. He's, he's, he wrote up the whole thing. His documentation is fantastic. Um, it's called Blue Fluff. Look him up on the internet. Um, so armed with Florian's excellent documentation, we were able to sort of figure out a bit more about what was happening with that Bluetooth connection. And what we observed is that um, this Furby Connect World app was downloading a DLC file, some kind of file, from those Hasbro servers to your smart device and then pushing it to the Furby over that Bluetooth connection. So naturally, we were quite interested in seeing what's actually inside that DLC file. And it turns out it looks like this. It's just like a blob of stuff, right? This is in a hex editor. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with looking at things like this. Uh, on the left, you've got um, hex bytes displayed as hex. And on the right, you've got their kind of ASCII representation where that's possible. Now, generally, when we're looking at a new file format, it's quite good to start at the beginning. That's where parsers will start when they're trying to read it. And you can look for things like file signatures. So if we have a look at the beginning of our file just here, um, that's it a bit bigger. At the very top there, hopefully you can see the letters F-U-R-B-Y, right? So this is a Furby file. They've got their own file signature. That's kind of cool. Um, but it's also a little bit puzzling because it means that it's not, not really a file that we know about, this Furby file. Um, so a lot of this project was, was kind of focused on trying to figure out what actually went into this DLC. Now you can see also, hopefully, in this header, there's what looks like a number of kind of strings of letters with dots between them. The reason there's dots there is because these are wide characters. They're 16 bits wide. Um, so you have a null byte every other character to kind of pad things out. If we just sort of strip all those, those uh, strings out and recombine them, what we get is something like this. We get what looks like a bunch of file names. That's really interesting. Now, thankfully, we're able to recover more than just one DLC from the Hasbro servers. We're actually able to recover a number of them and pull out all their strings as well, which look a little bit like this. And these, yeah, all look a little bit like file names, that's kind of cool. Now, Florian actually did one, one more thing. Other than looking at the, the, the Bluetooth and documenting all that stuff, he had a little bit of a, a, sort of a rough look at what was inside these DLC files. And he pulled out something that looked a bit like this. This is kind of, um, he was trying to kind of, I think, look at what bytes were roughly ranged where, and pulled out what looked like images. These look like sort of cartoon graphics. There's like a flame in the middle there or something. Now, if we have a look back at our promo video from earlier, that was the one with the video. This is a, a bit later in, in that. Um, you can see the Furby can actually show graphics in its eyes. You can hopefully make out a little chili character there um, with some fire coming out of its mouth. And I hope it's not too much of a, of a jump to see that possibly those, those kind of sprites that Florian pulled out of the, um, the DLC might kind of be that image. So that's kind of cool. Um, now, we didn't find that image in all of the DLCs we looked at, only um, this one, actually, this, this one on the left. So. Curiously, that DLC had a few extra file names, and those, those, it's those three at the top. So we thought, well, maybe these file names are somehow involved in the image. 
So at this point, we can start guessing, well, maybe they have those extensions kind of tell us what kind of image data is in there. Uh, and it's kind of hopefully not too much of a jump uh, of uh, sort of extrapolation to say that maybe PAL might stand for palette, um, SPR maybe for sprites, and CEL for cells. Those are all kind of like image sounding words, right? Um, at this point, we're very much just like trying things out and kind of guessing, which is very much what you kind of have to do at the start of a reversing project. Once we've kind of got that idea that maybe these file extensions tell us what is in these files, we can do it for the rest of it too. Um, so maybe the LPS section controls what the Furby's lips are doing. Who knows? Um, the one that really caused us some problems was uh, this guy in the middle, this XLS file. Is there an Excel spreadsheet in the Furby DLC? That seems a little bit strange. Um, so we figured maybe that probably isn't a spreadsheet. Instead, it's probably the execution list, XLS. Um, which sounds really, really good. As attackers, we generally want to go for things that have the word execution in them. They're generally kind of good things. Um, we actually, we had a look at that. It was very, very complicated. So instead of going in and trying to reverse that straight away, we started by looking at this section. Generally, when you're reversing anything, it's quite good to start with the small parts and build up the more complicated parts. Um, so we thought this might contain um, some Furby audio data. Now, under the hood, um, the Furby is using a general plus, uh, I can't remember the name of the processor, but it's a 16-bit um, low-power processor with a, with a strange kind of instruction set. Um, and it has its own uh, encoding for audio. Now, thankfully, general plus published their audio encoding tool, so you can actually grab a copy of this. And what this will do is if you hand it a WAV file, it will encode it into like Furby audio, this um, A1800, um, and, and sort of hand you that audio back. Now, unfortunately, we didn't want to kind of, we don't want to encode our own WAV files to Furby files. We want to take our Furby files and re backwards them to WAV files. So of course, the first thing we did was just rip apart this tool. And we found inside there this um, A1800 DLC. This exports these functions over here, um, which are kindly labeled for us. Um, and you can see there's a, there's a dec and an enc function in there, which possibly decode encode. That sounds like what you call that function, right? We've got encoding working. The tool does that for us already. So we had to look at the dec function instead. Um, this is the dec function in IDA Pro. Um, and you can see at the top there, there's a circle around um, the function's arguments. Hopefully, this, this is just pseudocode. This is kind of like a, a representation of what that file, uh, that function does. So the first two arguments to this function are strings of characters. And you can see where they're used. So the first one is used uh, in that second location there at an F open, which is opened in read mode. And the, the second argument to the function is, open, is used at a, that third location there, where it's also passed to F open with a, a, a write mode. So what this function is doing is it's opening one file to read from it, and it's opening another uh, file to, to write to it. So that's probably going to be our, our kind of our, our, um, our WAV in or our Furby audio in and our audio out, right? So we just used um, the, the Python C types module uh, to write a little wrap around this DLC and then call into it. And suddenly we could make our own Furby audio, which is great. So at this point, we could control the Furby's audio and also read from that DLC to get audio out. Um, once we kind of figured that out, we moved on to the next logical place to look, which is this, uh, this playlist section. So probably that will tie some of the audio, these audio clips together. It turns out it did. It was, it was very much um, just a simple um, linked list of indexes into that section. And we saw this theme kind of time and time again throughout the file. Um, if we want to have a look at how this audio all fits together, this is a little kind of diagram, a very simplified diagram of, of what the file is doing. Um, you can see that AMF section, which is yellow, uh, is pointed into by the APL, the playlist section. is like indexes into that. Um, the SEQ section contains pointers to which playlist you like to play. And that XLS section we talked about earlier, that uh, sort of points into the, the sequence section to tell you which sequence will be played for which Bluetooth command. So at this point, we can kind of get our Furby to play whatever audio you like. So we had a very interesting week uh, in which I played this song quite frequently to our office, um, I think to many people's disdain. Um, but yes, we, that, was, that was good fun. We weren't done at this point, though, because we, although we got control of the audio, we still wanted to get control of the Furby's eyes. Um, now, to do this, this, this sort of required a bit of, a bit of um, guesswork. Uh, I'm going to show you some parts from that SEQ section. Uh, that's over here. And these correspond to uh, these eye animations. Uh, these both involve a flashing yellow exclamation mark, which hopefully you can see. You've seen at the top there, and you should see at the bottom there just now. Um, now, we figured out that um, these SEQ kind of strings of words always ended with a zero, like a terminator, and always started with either hex 2000 or hex 3000. It didn't really seem to matter which one. We weren't super interested. It was like some sort of um, way of saying this is the beginning of a sequence. Um, this next word we figured out was uh, a pointer into that, um, that playlist section. So it would, it would tell you which playlist um, of audio would be played for a particular sequence. And this, um, this third word here, we figured out, pointed into that MTR section you might have seen earlier, which controlled um, how the Furby would move for a particular sequence. That gives us a whole bunch more words to figure out, like things to play with. So there's, there's no, there's, there really isn't anywhere else that this, uh, the Furby eye animations could be controlled from. So these words had to tell us how the, um, how the eye animations were, were happening. If we have a look at the first one here, uh, that's our sequence A, which corresponds to this eye animation over here. 
if you look carefully, it's actually not just one eye animation. It's actually made up of, 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 I think, three distinct sequences, which you should be able to see here. And these kind of feed into each other one after the next. We've got a kind of a, a little up to the right, we've got the, uh, the exclamation mark and a kind of a wobbly bounce type thing. Uh, and if you have a look at the words at the top there, I've highlighted there are actually three words that all start with hex 8000, which is kind of interesting. Maybe those, hex, those uh, 8000 words correspond to different eye animations. Um, crucially, uh, the one in the middle there is 8068. So if both these sequences have a flash exclamation mark in it, we should see it in the second sequence too. So let's have a look in sequence B. And we can already see that's 8068 in there. Let's see if it corresponds to a, an, an exclamation mark. And hopefully we can see the second kind of part of the animation is an exclamation mark again. Great. Um, so our, our hex 8068 is likely to refer to exclamation mark animations. And that first word might refer to um, that sort of wobble left and right we can see there. So we have a bit of confidence now. Maybe these words are referring to um, parts of animation. So what we should be able to do now is if we get an, an arbitrary bit of um, eye animation, here we've got two bulges and an exclamation mark, we should be able to predict we'd, we'd see two matching words followed by that hex 8068 in the sequence. And if we have a look, these gifts take a really long time to load. That's exactly what we see. So two repeated words followed by a hex 8068. Great. So we kind of, I think we should be confident now we've figured out how the eye animations are working. Um, now the problem here is that all these hex, hex 8000 words all pointed to animations that were already in the Furby's internal memory. What we wanted to do was point them at uh, memory that we controlled, so memory in that DLC file. And the only eye animation in there was that chili. Now, unfortunately, we found out that it wasn't possible to trigger the chili from any Bluetooth command we sent the Furby. Um, it looked like it was something that they, they added to the, the toy for a, the promotional video and since uh, removed that functionality. But we thought maybe it's still in there in, you know, in some way, just not triggerable. So what we did instead is we, um, we, we gathered up all the SEQ, those sequences we found, and we made a subset of uh, sequences which weren't triggerable from Bluetooth commands and then pulled out all the, uh, the hex 8000 words that were in them. And what we found is that was actually quite a small subset. It was these guys. Now, hopefully looking at these, you can see there's one that stands out like a sore thumb. It's the second one there. It's not a hex 8000 word, it's a hex 8400 word. Um, so that looks quite fishy already. So then what we did was we took that word and we overwrite it over all the different hex 8000 words in the Furby's memory, and lo and behold, we found it would quite happily play back the chili for us. Excellent. So at this point, we have control of, um, we have control of some memory, and we we're able to trigger the Furby to play back that memory for us. The last thing we need to do is, is figure out what we need to write to that memory to make the Furby process it as images. So Florian had done some work on figuring out where that, that information was stored, but not necessarily how to decode it. These images were actually pulled out of the, the cell section. So let's have a look there first. This is what the cell section looks like. Um, there's not much kind of structural information there for us to play around with, but you can see a repeated pattern, hopefully. Um, you can see a lot of A's repeated over and over again. So let's look a little bit closer. What you should see here is that this is actually periodic in three bytes. We're seeing 04, 10, 41, over and over and over and over again. Um, you could also say this is actually periodic in, in nibbles as well. So you're seeing 0, 4, 1, 0, 4, 1, over and over and over again. Um, if we have a look at what that looks like as binary, um, that's this number. Um, so B 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, um, which looks like it's kind of periodic in six bits, yeah? So maybe this is a bunch of six-bit numbers packed together to save space. That kind of makes sense. If we're seeing one over and over and over again, that's kind of likely kind of the background color. Um, now, a lot of images like bitmaps and that, they kind of, they, they store the color information for a particular pixel at that location. What we saw earlier is that this, this, this Furby is likely using palettes. So rather than storing that pixel color information at the pixel, it'll store an index into a palette saying, I'd like to use that color for this pixel, please. So let's have a look at our palette section. Not really much information in there either. So the way that we kind of figured out what was going on here was by doing a little bit of quite simple maths. Please bear with me, this isn't scary at all. Um, what we already know is that um, each color, uh, each pixel has a, a, a six-bit um, index which points to a, a color in a palette. With a six-bit number, you can express 64 different values. So we know that every palette has to be about 64 values big. Um, the length of this palette section is hex C100. So if we know the length of, of the palette section and we know um, how many palettes are in it, um, we need to kind of figure out some number that is the size of a color uh, times the number of palettes in the section and multiply that by the, the number of colors in a palette to give us a total length. Hopefully that makes sense. So if we divide the, the total length of the section by the number of colors in a palette, we should get this number, which is the size of a, a single color times the number of palettes in the section. So we can factorize that in lots of different ways. One of them is we can say, 
you know, 48 is 4 times 12. And that would tell us there's, there's 12 palettes, each of them containing uh, 4 byte color. That's great. RGBA, hopefully, we've encountered this before. Um, it turns out if you try and decode the information that way, it just doesn't work. Things come out looking very, very strange. You get lots of kind of flamingo pinks. Not really what you want. Um, another way you can, you can factorize it as, as 3 times 16. That sounds more sensible. Uh, and that would give us um, RGBA co or RGB color, so just 3 bytes per color. Um, but that didn't work either. And what we were observing is that the Furby is actually using some kind of transparency layer, so RGB doesn't describe transparency. So this was never going to work from the outset. Another way we could factorize it is as 2 times 24. That would give us 24 palettes with 2 byte color. Two byte color is kind of strange. Um, we hadn't encountered that before, but it turns out that's exactly what was happening. This was using some kind of very old way of describing color that uses um, two bytes. Two bytes is 16 bits. Um, that's uh, five bits per color R RGB and one bit of transparency. Um, and by sort of juggling those colors around a little bit just to figure out which, which channel was which, we were able to um, decode the images in the, in the DLC and pull out these sprites, which we, we could then recombine to actually make the Furby's uh, chili graphic back again, which is this guy. Great. So if we, can, if we can pull the graphics out of the DLC, we can also put our own, our own ones back, um, which of course we did straight away to produce this wonderful bit of stock imagery. <laughs> um, and <we'll laughs> we'll be doing that live in a second, don't worry. Um, this is, just to kind of round up, this is a bit of an overview of how the DLC file all fits together, which sections point to which other ones. Um, you can look at this on our GitHub. It's not really important for right now. Um, so Witch really liked all this. They were really happy with what we did, and they made a little video about it. This is, um, that is there's a bit of audio here, but don't worry too much about it. That's Mr. Witch. He's this saying, guy, you can hack a Furby. The Furby is going to be one of the most popular Christmas toys. But how safe is it? Or could you use a mobile phone to hack it? Yes, yes, you could. If you have... So Hasbro uh, are the current manufacturers of Furby Connects. We wrote to them telling them our findings, and this is their response. Um, sadly, it's not quite as positive as we would have hoped, um, but they did at least respond to us, which is marvelous. Um, a couple of bits that really stand out here is uh, this, these two highlighted sections. There are a number of very specific conditions that would need to be satisfied in order to achieve the result described. Really? Uh, you need to be within range of a Bluetooth connection, so not really too specific. Uh, and the other, the other part that stands out is a tremendous amount of reverse engineering would be required to reverse the product. Um, not really understanding the fact that you need to do this once, and once it's done, it's done. So you do the, the work once, and then anyone can do this at all. So what we heard was, hacking Furbies is hard, please make it easier for us. <laughs> um, so we make, well, Paul threw together this wonderful, um, it's a, it's a, <laughs> a web page that you can use. You can actually use this, this web, uh, with, with the capture web page to, um, to hack your Furby. Uh, and you can, this will all run offline. I've got a copy of it running here. And we're going to try and do a demo now. This might not work, but please cross your fingers. So I have a victim here. Um, this is going to make some really annoying noises. Just. That's how you wake them up. Okay, he's booting up. Um, what we can do in the meantime is I can use my app to have a look for Furbies within range. And I do this by clicking on connect. Uh, I turn on my Bluetooth, that would help. Okay, uh, you probably can't see this at the back, but I've found one Furby within range. Thank you everyone for having your Furbies off. This is why I asked you to turn them off. They all, they're all called Furby, so I wouldn't know which one to go for. So let's connect to my Furby. And I've paired with him, and I'm, I'm connected now. Now what I can do is I can pick a DLC file to upload. We're going to go for the hacked logo. And I'm going to click on Upload. And hopefully, come on, buddy. Come on. Of course. OK, I'm going to try again. That didn't work. OK, we're connected again. I'm going to try and upload the logo. No luck. We'll try one more time, and then we'll call it a day, I think.
Okay, no such luck, unfortunately. Demo gods weren't smiling on us today. Um, but if you'd like to play with our code, this is all available uh, on the context. Uh, I think the code is available for making DLCs on the context GitHub. Um, Paul Stone's uh, GitHub has the, the web page that you can play with. Um, if you've got Furbies, please download it and have fun making your own DLCs. It's great. Um, okay. Oh. Okay, so we'll just quickly round up then. So, aside from the cool demo that could have been, why should we really care? I mean, this is only a kid's toy, right? Like, what, what does it matter if it gets hacked? Um, so, one thing which I hope you can take away from here is that although this, we're not really kind of running code or, you know, getting a root shell, the kind of way that you approach this is very much the same way that you do your exploit development, like for, for a normal kind of target. So we, we've identified some attack surface there, that DLC file coming in, we've reverse engineered it to figure out how it's working, we did, we've sort of made some kind of crafted input that we then pointed execution at, or video kind of execution at, um, to take control of the target, which is exactly kind of what you do when you're attacking a binary. Um, hopefully you've also seen that reversing is not all IDA Pro or Radar. Um, you can actually do quite a lot of really good reversing in a hex editor um, without specialist tools that co cost lots of money. Um, so please go away and do lots of awesome reversing. Uh, and lastly, um, as I'm sure every IoT talk will reiterate, um, connected devices continue to be vulnerable, manufacturers continue to be difficult to work with, um, and things continue to break. Um, so please bear that in mind when you buy devices and or try and attack them. Thank you very much for uh, listening to the talk today. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, that's my Twitter. Please say hi. Um, and I, if you want, I can take some questions as well. Hello. Hey. Um, c can you uh, give the malicious audio files as well, or just the uh, like? Whether like, were, were, like, was it just the eyes, where you could specify whatever you wanted? Sorry, could you just repeat that one more time? Um, like the like the Furby makes noises, right? Mm -hmm. So could you inject your own like audio in there as well? Brilliant. Yes. The question was, could you inject your own audio? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Florian actually did some work on trying to kind of um, patch his own audio into the DLC, which he did successfully, um, and we were able to kind of improve on that. So when well, when the demo would have happened, you would have heard the Furby talking as well as his playing eye graphics. Um, with a bit of extra work, you could also control the the mouth movements and actually the motions the Furby does too. But it's all possible. Um, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks, Ed. Thank you.